It is my honor and my privilege this morning to bring to you today this young man that I've grown to love dearly over the last few years as I met him for the first time, I believe, at Pastor Mickey Hales. Had the privilege of being in Virginia, and he came. I don't know if he really came for church or just come to see Mickey's daughter. It was probably the latter. Probably the latter. Uh, uh, but uh, we uh, uh, we was able to connect, and we we have grown to love him and his father, and uh, we are just so grateful to have him. So can you make welcome as this young man comes, and he's going to share with us the word of the Lord this morning, Brother J.T. Harmon this morning. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Somebody said, one time me and my nephew was talking about what our catchphrase would be, and he said, JT, if you had a catchphrase, it would be, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. And I'm pretty proud of that. But um, I count it a very high honor and privilege. Um, I never could put it into words how much uh, Barnabas Ministries has meant to me at a young age as a young minister. I feel that I've received so much already that I could never pay it back fully. And uh, people like you all, pastors and laborers that are on the front lines, that old song, Keep on the Firing Lines, uh, that toll and press and pay the price daily to see the gospel go forward, you all are my heroes. And have been because I grew, grew up in church. I'm a fourth generation uh, preacher. I learned uh, the importance of working for the Lord at a young age. I was in pulpit ministry uh, playing the drums when I was young. And, uh, you know, as, as a young guy, uh, I, get, I tip my hat to Brother Ron uh, for having me and Jordan and, and uh, be allowing us to speak in his pulpit because... Uh, when me and Jordan's done talked about it, we're only going to get on thin ice sometimes t today. We're just going to tread on thin ice a little bit today, not too much. But uh, it's just an honor. It's a tremendous honor. Barnabas Ministries is, a, is an awesome thing, and, and I'm just honored and privileged to be a part of it. Uh, Bishop Ely and Sister Carol, uh, I, I don't think there's any two sweeter people with a better spirit, but most importantly, uh, when, when you look at Brother Ely, you know, I think sometimes I'm joking with him and, and hearing him be jokative, but at the same time, he holds such an authority for the kingdom of God that God's placed on his life, and I honor that, and I appreciate it so much, and I thank you all, and each of you ministers, I thank the Lord for you. Just give, give, the, give yourself a hand clap for being awesome. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And, I, you know, I... I one of the things I really, really love about Barnabas Ministries is that, um, and I've been to two conferences so far. Uh, my dad got to come to one that I had to miss, and uh, but each time I've been, of course, I've been to three, actually. I take that back, the young pastor's uh, teaching, and uh, what I've noticed and what stood out to me so much is that there's no incentive or motive to get up and perform. It's not about performing, and I know at a young age, you know, We've all been there. I, I came through that, and probably I'm still coming through it, but you want to get up and perform because that's just what it's like to be a preacher. Bless the Lord. But I've learned that through Barnabas Ministries and through many other people that it's not about performing, but it's about delivering. It's about delivering what God. It's about getting with the Lord and receiving something from God and delivering it to those that are there. It doesn't matter what opportunity it is, but when God gives you an opportunity, be ready to deliver what he's given and placed in your spirit. And uh, I just thank the Lord for this opportunity. I love, um, like I said, I love the Ely's. I, I would have to say, uh, Sister Jamie, I believe she keeps the thing running. I really do. She does a lot, and uh, she was here I would say that, and Brother uh, Maisel Jr., and just, just a, a sweet family, and I love each and every one of you. I'm thankful to have my mom and dad here with us today, and uh, my mom covers up all the sour notes that I hit. Well, not sour, sour notes that I hit when I'm singing. Uh, Brother uh, Mark Sarver done called us this morning. We act like we're Southern from where I'm at, but we're not Southern. We're hillbilly. 
We're hillbilly. We're from the hills. Some people call it the sticks. And, uh, you know, uh, we got hills. Somebody said uh, that we got hills. We don't have hills. We've got mountains where I'm from in southwest Virginia. And I seen a place somewhere down the road that said Mountain Spa, and it was on top of a little hill like this just down the road there. I said, uh-uh, that's not Mountain Spa. That's, that's little hill spa. And uh, y'all, I love the flat country. I love it. It's beautiful. I've never seen so far in my life, I don't think, as you can see in Indiana. And I call it flat, okay? I call it flat, but they're sitting here saying, we got hills. But you don't have hills, Brother Ron. Let me tell you, we got mountains where I'm from. And you know what I'm talking about. You've been in the area. But anyway, uh, Dad said something about singing a song instead of singing. Singing. And uh, somebody said one time we was at a meeting, and a man was from Georgia, uh, and that's the true southern accent right there. You know, we hide behind the southern accent, but we're hillbilly. And he said, well, how do you pronounce S-O-U-R? And my dad looked at him and said, Sayer. And he said, that's how we know that you're su- southern to the bone. So uh, anyway, I just count this an honor and a privilege today. I've been busting all morning with what I feel like the Lord has placed on my heart today. And uh, I want us to just turn to Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and, uh, through 10. And I, again, I'm thankful to have my mom and uh, dad with me. They've sowed into my life more than I could ever uh, give back to them. And I'm just blessed to have them. Amen. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, if I've left anything out of my introduction, somebody let me know. Amen. Praise the Lord. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 10. This isn't a complicated, uh, sophisticated word this morning. It's just a simple word that I feel like God's given me, but you can be complex and out of the will of God and out of season with the word, and I feel like the Lord placed this on my heart, and I just want to deliver it today the best I can. Starting in verse 7, where God says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap of the flesh corruption. And he that soweth to the Spirit shall reap of the Spirit life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Hallelujah. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And I want to use just for a subject, just for a few moments, this morning the subject due season due season I feel like in prayer God spoke to me and I, I, I sought you know the Lord for what to minister and I feel like he spoke to me and said I want you to tell my labors the ones that are on the front line that due season is just around the corner I feel that in my spirit that due season is coming up just around the corner And to not grow weary in well-doing. And I just feel that in my spirit. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy, for your grace, for your goodness. Lord, we could do nothing without you, Lord, unless you anoint it, unless you use us, God. We ask that you would touch our ears, Lord, to hear what the Spirit is saying. God, help us to be sensitive to what your Spirit is doing today, Lord. We ask that you would put your word in our heart. Let it grow and increase and bring forth fruit. And we give you praise and glory. And everybody in this house says... Amen and amen. I want us to understand something today, and y'all bear with me because I'm used to preaching to people that's not preaching back to me all the time. So if I get a little too simple for you, just give me this thing right here and say, keep on going, brother. But understand this. I guess you all know as experience, and I've learned this in my short time in the ministry, it's kind of easy to get weary as a pastor, as a local pastor. Because it seems like you plow sometimes and plow and you plow. But if you compare your plowing and your work to the shape of this world, it's very easy to let that get to you and make you get weary sometimes. When we look around and see the shape, the condition of the world, it's so easy to see the darkness and the wickedness that is going on all around us and let that make us have this idea, well, is what I'm doing really making an effect? Is it, really, is it really pushing back the powers of darkness like I've prayed for? 
And, and I know all of y'all, some of y'all are young ministers. I'm not saying I need to quit acting like everybody in here is old. Y'all are young and still got a lot of fire in you. I, I'm not saying that. But y'all have been doing this thing a whole lot longer than me and Brother Jordan has. And I'm sure y'all remember when you was their age. My goodness, you had the world by the tail and you was ready to start preaching and chase every devil to hell and back. I mean, that's just the way it is as a young minister. But I'm telling you, the, the generation that I've, I grew up in, it, it seems like now it's grown even farther away from the things of God. I remember when I was in high school, there was such a heaviness. There was such a load that I felt like that I carried. Even though I wasn't a preacher, I was in ministry, I was in the pulpit, I knew I was called, but I felt that load pressing down on me because there was powers of darkness just flowing through the local schools, through the uh, school uh, buildings and all around me. I, I remember passing students uh, that would just give me chills when I passed them because they had went so far into unrighteousness, into darkness. I remember having that feeling. And, and I know that if you look and if you have anything to do with the school system of today's world, you know that how much it increasingly is growing darker and darker and more wicked. How much the kids are being indoctrinated with junk and garbage that, that should never be taught to kids and should never even be graced in the schoolhouse. But they're kicking everything out, it seems like, that has anything to do with good and putting everything in that has everything to do with evil. They said that when Rome fell, when Germany fell, one of the main things that they started with is dumbing the people down, making them uh, not able to read and not able to, sit, to understand things. And my goodness, I remember just a few months ago that my nephew said that when they do 12 times 12, instead of saying it's 144, they can say, well, it's around 140. I mean, this is stuff that's being taught to our kids that's just ridiculous. This is in the schools and these are things that we see and understand and I know as a pastor when you go back to your area I believe every all the pastors are mostly from Indiana and Kentucky it seems like and half of them is, is named Jerry just like me somebody said somebody said J, somebody said what does JT stand for okay I'll just get that out of the way right now J stands for Jerry but T doesn't stand for anything my parents just gave me the letter T because they said most preachers have JT or T initials for their name that's what they now I'm just playing about that the T actually stands I, I, I'll throw this out there the T actually stands remember remember where I was at wickedness dark okay the T stands in, in our mind it's just a T on my birth certificate but it stands for my grandmother's name Trula that's what it is meant to resemble or reflect because they couldn't call me Trula but <laughs> but they called me J, Jerry T and I got tired of explaining that story to all my friends in high school. Can you imagine explaining that every time? What does the T stand for? What does the T stand for? And I finally just said, well, it stands for Thomas. That's what I told him. I told him that. I told him that in about eighth grade. And by the time I got in 12th grade and had to sign my certificate of graduation, I put Jerry Thomas on the thing. So that just stays in here. I might be graduated and I might not legally be graduated if we compare it to my birth certificate. But, under, I mean, w w we look at the world and it brings such a load and, and we go back to our areas and no doubt the areas that you were in have their own problems and situations. I remember going with Pastor Moody up, up in Richmond, Kentucky and he showed me a Hindu temple that was being built about a mile down from his church mile down from his church, millions of dollars spent on this Hindu temple. I told him the closest thing we've got to that in my area is a Baptist church. <laughs> that was a joke. That was another joke. <laughs> Y'all going to think I'm brother, what's his name, from Louisiana? I'm not normally this funny, okay? <laughs> but in seriousness... Our areas have their own problems and situations. I'll just soak it in. I'm no, normally not this funny. I'll just soak it on in. <laughs> but our areas have their own situations. And I thank God. I thank God for my area. I do. My grandmother told me about two years ago before the pandemic happened. Well, I'll say, that, I'll say it like this. She 
called me about a month before it happened, and she said, JT, you've been talking about David Wilkerson a lot. I enjoy listening to Brother David Wilkerson on YouTube. And she said, I was cleaning my closet out, and a brown envelope fell down. And it had David Wilkerson prophetic um, message to all his followers or something like that. And she said, I wanted to give it to you. So I got it. I didn't open it. I went and sat it on the desk and left it behind. And about a week later, she told me, JT, I've just been feeling in my spirit in prayer that people's going to start to leave the cities and come to this area. And I said, my, my goodness, we don't have, where I'm from, you have to drive 30 minutes to the closest Walmart. I don't know how it is here, but you have to drive 30 minutes to the closest Walmart, 20 minutes to the closest McDonald's. I said, what would anybody leave all the, the city life and all the good uh, uh, um, things that they have uh, that are just right at their fingertips and come here? But all of a sudden, riots started to break out in the cities. Fires. So I went, when I seen these things happen, I said, I might order to go read that letter from David Wilkerson that grandmother gave me two weeks ago before any of this happened. Sure enough, I broke into that, and it was a prophecy. And I'm sure anybody that has maybe listened to David Wilkerson's heard it. He said that there would be fires, thousands of fires in the cities of America. He said people would flee. The, I about dropped to the floor when I read it because this was now about a couple months into the pandemic. He said people would begin to leave the cities and come to more rural areas. He said that there would be a lack of toiletry. You tell me a prophet that's that accurate today. There's a whole lot of prophets, but tell me one that's that accurate today. And he, he began to say all these things in that, and I began to see it and. He, he said that all these things would happen, but God would see his righteous few through it. But I, I begin to thank God for my area, but even my area burdens me for the sin and the wickedness. Even though I feel like I'm in, a, in an area that's shielded from a lot of the things that's going on maybe in the cities. Like I said, we don't have a Hindu temple. We don't have all these things in our area. But still the darkness and wickedness. The Bible says prophetic passages that Jesus said that gross darkness would fill the earth. That iniquity would abound so much that the love of many would just wax cold. It would become cold. There wouldn't be a, a love like we've known it. My goodness, we see that in the house. In the family. They don't love their kids anymore. They don't love their uh, families. And we see that in the households of America today. And it makes you grow weary. Habakkuk was there. We go back into in the old the, the prophet Habakkuk and he was burdened. And understand this. I'm talking about being weary right now. It's easy to get weary. Look at Habakkuk. Look at Elijah. Elijah was hiding in the cave because he, he had just fought all the prophets of Baal. And now here he was just a few days later hiding and weary of the ministry because of the burden that it brought on him and Habakkuk said he had a burden for the people of Israel he said God you show me the wickedness you show me the sin but it's not being punished I don't understand Lord I don't understand why the darkness is going and the law and the judgment has slacked but I'm thankful that people like Habakkuk people like Elijah people like you all when they get burdened it's not burdened because of the call. It's burdened for the call. I said it's not because, but it's for. I can't help, like they said in Acts, to get down and tell you what I hear and what I see. I see miracles. I hear the anointing at church, and the world needs it, and we need to be burdened for it. Burdened. My goodness burden for it. Let me tell you, God allows some things to take place. Sometimes he withdraws his hand of mercy to allow things to shake the church up, to shake the burden up inside of them. Brother Gibson told me a while back when I was at the first conference that I came to, he said, JT, he come up to me to the side, y'all, uh, anybody's had this moment where it was just you and another minister that's more seasoned than you. And he said, JT, let me tell you something. He said, sometimes the coal will run out. He said, but it's so important that you go back to the altar and get another coal to place on your lips and get burdened for what it is. Church, it's wicked. It's dark. It's pure ungodliness. But let us be burdened like Habakkuk for the call and the wickedness that's going on. My, 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 my. Habakkuk seen it. Habakkuk felt it. 
and we're feeling it. We're feeling it now. It seems like we've never felt it before. My goodness, I, I, I remember when I was younger, it just seemed like, and I might be wrong, but it just seemed like when you come into church, it was like a ticking time bomb ready to go off. A Holy Ghost shout down. I mean, I remember we used to have Sunday night services. We don't have those anymore. We have one service on Sunday. And I remember we used to have Sunday night. My goodness, people were falling out left and right. I, had to, I was so little, I had to dodge people. It was like a Holy Ghost ticking time bomb, Brother Maisel. But now, we have the anointing. I'm not saying we don't. But it seems like, is it just me or does it seem like when we get together for church, it's just a little harder to press because of the burden. I said the burden that the world's presenting. The burden of wickedness and darkness. It's gotten harder to press, to push. It's, it's, in other words, they, they always say that, uh, that, that the more time goes, the more things you're going to cost. And, and, you know, I understand that that. In the book of, of Genesis, there was such wickedness that God destroyed the earth. But I have to believe that the world has never been as wicked, wicked and idle craving as it is now. I have to feel that in my, I feel that in my spirit. That, that, that there's so many opportunities to make idols. There's so many opportunities to make uh, things in front of God. And there's so many opportunities to sin. I mean, look at technology. Look at these phones and what it opens young people up to at a young age. And look at the opportunity for bondage to grip our young people at such a young age. I mean, they start out in bondage before they get to the age of accountability. I mean, before before they even reach the age where they can decide Jesus uh, as their Savior, they're trying to let, tell them that it's okay to decide if you want to be a boy or a girl. Before, they're, they're trying to do that at a young age. We see that wickedness and burdensome. But understand this, as time goes on, that old saying is it's just going to get more expensive and expensive. And grandmother was telling me just the other day when she started renting a house, her and Papa, that, that a month salary for my Papa was $50 and the house costed $12 a month to rent. I mean, I was thinking, my goodness, me and Mariah are engaged and we're looking at stuff and our mouth drops to the floor when you look at a single white trailer that's $200,000. I said, golly, I'd like to go back to the $12 a month rental days. And I'd like to go back to when the Holy Ghost was just a ticking time bomb in the churches. The turn of the 20th century. Millions. It's recorded that millions have been baptized in the Holy Ghost since then. Oh, I'd like to go back. But God... I, I hear that a lot, and I love it. I love the testimonies. I sit with grandmother. She's 88 years old. She'll just tell me of the things she's seen. I'll sit there all day and listen to her, Brother Maisel. But I wouldn't go back because God's put us here now to pay the steeper price. Now, it might be a, a, a harder price that you have to pay. David saw the sword over Israel, and he went to the threshing floor of Aruna. His heart smote him. And I'm thankful we still got men of God that are convicted deeply. Thankful for that. I left that young pastor's conference, Brother Courtney, convicted deeply. And I'll tell you what, I went home, and I felt like I would gotten a little. Y'all talked about entitlement till my tail was red. Are we live on Facebook? I don't <laughs> apologize to the viewers. And I went home to my grandmother and I said, Grandmother, I'm sorry for some things. Because I, I learned in that, and I've learned through my life, deep conviction is rare. And David seen that in Israel. He saw the plague. And he was deeply smote and convicted. And he went to Aruna, the Jebusite, at the threshing floor where life becomes real. And he said, I've got to rear an altar to God. I've got to sacrifice. 
And what did Aruna say? He said, well, king, you're the king. This is from a, a priest to a king. It's all yours. But David said, I will not offer to my God that which I've not paid a price for. And understand this, church. The times we're going through are necessary. I said they're necessary. In order to see a great purchase, you've got to pay a great price. And Listen, for the plague to be stayed, a price has got to be paid. I said for the plague, for the plague that we see in our schools, for the plague that we see in our young people, for the plague that we see in our society, in order for that to be stayed, it's necessary for the church to go through some hard times. But let me tell you, through those times God births something greater than you could ever get in times of prosperity he gets something greater he digs down deep inside and gets the pure beaten all that it takes hardness to get it out of the pure beaten all that keeps the lamp burning all night brother my goodness, it keeps it burning. Some people are trying to run on the, on, the, on the cheap oil. But God wants the pure, he told the priest, the pure beaten oil. The oil that's most precious. The oil that takes a crushing to get to. And, and I feel like we're going through that time right now. But God sent me here. i got to wind the things up because it's 1050. God sent me here. Although the, 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 the handwriting might be on the wall. And, and, and God's finger might be writing on the wall. It's evident that it's on the wall. We see it on the wall now. It's just like Babylon. It seems like the United States has played the harlot and went after other gods. It has. It don't seem like it. It has. They went after other gods. They went after other religions. They went after everything that the church wants to offer and, and put it under the, the guise of Christianity. They've tried to accept this and that and the other but God is writing on the wall and there's few preachers that's able to discern that handwriting but for the ones that are able to discern it God is going to reveal himself it was it listen it was in Babylon that God showed Daniel he was in the lion's den it was in Babylon that God showed the Hebrew boys that he's the God of the fiery furnace it was in Babylon church it was in Babylon it was in Babylon that God showed David, I'll answer your, uh, uh, Daniel, I'll answer your prayers. You keep praying, you keep fasting as long as it takes, and you'll get a hold of me and move my hand. Church, we're seeing it now. We might be in Babylon, but I serve God in Babylon. <laughs> Hallelujah. My goodness. The handwriting might be on the wall. We see it playing out in front of us, but God's showing us that the sowing, we read there in Galatians. I'll get to my text now. The, the sowing to the Spirit pays off, not the sowing to the flesh. Uh, my, I mean, there's so many opportunities to sow th to the flesh. There's so many opportunities to sow to all kinds of things. But God is saying if you sow to the Spirit, if you get in the Spirit, if you walk in the Spirit, if you live in the Spirit, if you make your living and your abode and, and David said I've made the Lord my, the most high my habitation I've, I've made it my dwelling place I've learned that I've become very acquainted with that voice I have an ear to hear what the Spirit's saying my goodness I, I preached a message a while back to what voice are you lending your ear to and people's got an ear to hear everything else but what the Spirit is saying the sowing to the Spirit the sowing to the Spirit is what makes a difference and church your sowing to the Spirit. I'm telling you, it's going to pay off. God sent me down here for some reason, a young person, and they said, and Brother Maisel and Brother Ron both said that God revealed it to them, that they wanted to have somebody young. I said, my goodness, they're brave to have somebody young preach to a bunch of preachers that's been doing it for so long. But God put it on my heart to tell the church, to tell the labors, that the sowing to the Spirit is going to pay off in due season. I said due season is on the way hallelujah due season is on the way for the church I don't care how long you pressed and wearied and, and, and pressed toward to, through Babylon God is going to bring a due season to this thing does somebody believe that today hallelujah hallelujah due season is going gonna, is gonna to come I believe that 
My grandmother, once again, I refer to her a lot because she's been such a, a, a spiritual uh, mother to me in my life. And she, she's told me multiple times, JT, I believe God's going to renew uh, his, his spirit in a way that the world's never seen it to the church. I believe he is, church. I believe it. I, I can't help but believe it. I don't think according to biblical uh, uh, characteristics that show the character of God, I don't feel that God is going to allow the church to limp across the finish line. I don't feel that. I don't feel that in my spirit, but I believe God's going to take us out of this thing full of the Holy Ghost, full of power. When, my goodness, when he came, when, when, when Isaac saw her, she was dressed with jewels. She was dressed with everything. Eliezer threw the jewels on her neck. God's going to take the church out of this thing as a bride adorned for their groom. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My goodness, he's going to take the church out. Malachi said it like this. I wrote these scriptures down. Malachi, the last verses of the Old Testament, the last prophet in the Old Testament, said, Behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven. My goodness, we're seeing it. Burning as an oven. It's like the, 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 the uh, uh, fiery furnace is turned up seven times hotter now. It's just like it seems like it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And it seems like uh, that... that the United States and nations around it uh, get, uh, continue to, to seep farther and farther away into darkness, into wickedness. We see that so, so evident. And, and, and it's just very, uh, under, it, it brings us understanding of the times. It's, it's like the prophetic verses and passages in the Bible. It's, they're no longer telling of what's going to happen. But we're seeing it happen now. Paul said the time will come when they won't endure sound doctrine. Listen. And the time has come that they won't endorse sound doctrine. We're seeing that, and no doubt it'll get worse. But the time has. We're seeing it now so, uh, so big time in the world today. And Malachi said it, that it'll burn like an oven. And all the proud, uh, all the proud, it seems like sin has the tap tag of proudness on it nowadays. It's being thrust and indoctrinating our kids, like I said at the beginning. It's, it's, it's proud. It's a proudness. They just did a parade from where I'm from just an hour through the streets of a local city that, uh, that, that where uh, all these people came together and all these people came together and they just it just seemed like they were flaunting it at the Lord, that they were doing wicked, they didn't care, you could do whatever you wanted to. They had children involved. Y'all can read between the lines and tell what I'm talking about. They had children involved and here there was 15,000 people doing it and they were also churches supporting it saying, oh, well, we're going to be a part of that. We're going to put a float in the parade and all these things. And it just seems like that. But I like what Malachi said. He said, but. There's a big word right there. But. Unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing. Hallelujah. <laughs> healing in his wings church I believe that due season is on its way in the Bible we read of the former rain and the latter rain Joel told us that he will cause it to come down in the former rain and in the latter rain in the first month the latter rain uh, it refers to two rainy season in uh, the former and the latter refers to two rainy seasons in Israel the first which is the former came in October and it promoted germination and growth in the seed that was sown. The former rain came at the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God moved. Jesus planted the church and the Spirit began to water the church and make the church what it is. And it began to grow through the dark ages. And God began to pour it out in such a mighty way that the apostles were used so mightily by the Spirit. They didn't understand how they was going to take this thing on. They didn't understand it. But it was the Spirit of God. It was the Holy Spirit poured out on the day of Pentecost. Brother Maisel preached a, a message at Brother Mickey's church a few uh, years ago about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. I'll never forget it. He looked at me and he said, young man, this message is for you to preach the baptism with the Holy Spirit and take it to the churches because it's being lost. And let me tell you, church, we need to get full of the Holy Ghost and let that message be the premier message that's going to take the church into the latter rain. The Spirit was poured out at Pentecost and that began to germinate the 
the church and make it what it was and help it grow in the latter rain coming in April in Israel it matured the crops and got them ready for harvest and I believe it's very evident through scripture that we are coming close to harvest time we're coming close to due season we're coming close to the rapture of the church and it's not God's will for the church to finish this thing weak but I believe God's going to raise it up in a way that the world's never seen it we know the Holy Spirit but I want to know him deeper and we're going to see that happen in the church and I understand this through scripture church as we close this message boy time just runs away from you don't it as we're closing I'll tell you what I want us to do God put this on my spirit how to end it I said JT how, how what do I do with Spurgeon said as the earth and mom if you want to just come to the piano if you would just to play something soft and I'll turn it to brother Ely and pastor Ron Spurgeon said that the earth was dependent on showers to bring forth harvest. That's what Spurgeon said years ago, not in 1889. And how much more is the souls of man dependent on showers from heaven to come down on the church? I believe that due season is around the corner for the church. But God said, don't be weary in well-doing. For if you don't faint... If we don't give up and don't quit, if we keep doing what we're doing, if we keep sowing to the Spirit, God's going to bring us a harvest, help us burn for that harvest. That last verse says, as we therefore have opportunity, I feel like this is as good of an opportunity as we could have, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. I I Heard the end of Brother Maisel's message on Facebook Live. I didn't know it was going to be on there. I haven't got to watch the whole thing. But I heard him talking about Brother uh, Howard Jones, I think it was, wrote a book on unity, right? Unity. And uh, <laughs> one thing I cannot stand, it's my pet peeve, is church competition. I can't stand it. I, I just cannot stand it. And it happens a lot. And I just, this is what God put on my spirit to do at the end of this service. We have opportunity. And I believe that this due season that God has promised in the last days, that He's going to pour out His Spirit and we're going to see it. I believe we are. That's going to combat the wickedness. I want all of us to just come, if we could, up to the front and gather hands. And uh, pastors, anybody that's not here, it doesn't matter. I, I don't, you know. And, and I want us to just gather hands. I, I don't want us to get at the altar. I want us to gather hands. Hallelujah. Lord, we come together in Jesus' name. And, and I want us to just together pray for harvests, for due seasons, for due seasons to happen.